everyone. This is Michelle Moross, and welcome to Mental Shift. Uh, today, whoa, wait a minute, stop. If you don't know who I am and you happen to be stumbling across Mental Shift, welcome. Mental Shift is a podcast that really started about a year and a half ago on a radio show, and it's now formed into a podcast because Mental Shift. We bring on people and we talk about what they've done in their life and what mental shift happened that has brought them into a whole new realm of whatever they're doing to find their passion. And so I bring people on, individuals, business owners, and entrepreneurs to discuss their journey. And there is an amazing journey you're about to hear today. And I invited this young lady with me. Her name is Ann Foistel. She is a Actually, I've known her for a very long time. I've just never really sat and talked to her. I know her mom. <laughs> uh, Anne is the founder and owner of Writing Wisely. You can find more about this at www.wearewritingwisely.com. And I invited her up because she has a new book out called Our Favorite Movies, How Films Affect Our Mental Health. And I thought, dang. I need Anne on here because we need to talk because one, I'm a big movie buff. Two, side bit, I'm in a movie that's coming out in March 2020 called Jurassic Thunder. And if you want to go on to IMDb, look me up. I am also in a movie called Zunambi. So I have speaking roles in both and they will mess your mind up. So maybe you don't if, you, if you're not a sci-fi fan. So welcome, Anne. I'm a little distracted today. Can you tell? It's okay. I am really excited to see these movies. I didn't hear about that before, so. They're all That's independently cool. made. Cool, very oh, cool. Oh, Anne, tell, tell us about your book. Well, no, wait, we, let's back up. Tell us about your journey and what brought you to make this book? What brought that out? Well, I'm gonna sort of start um, actually going back to age 10. Um, I've been dealing with um, depression and anxiety since I was 10. And then um, I was, at first I was diagnosed with depression uh, in my teens and then given the uh, diagnosis of by both uh, bipolar disorder and generalized anxiety disorder in my early 20s. And I had a, a lot of problems in college. I was hospitalized for my mental health several times um, but I realized one night when I couldn't sleep, I was manic. Um, I realized that watching the movie The Princess Bride uh, was something that actually took all my mental health sy symptoms away. I was able to just for that two hours to really just be in the movie and live in that movie. It was a movie as I'm sure many people have seen The Princess Bride over and over and over again, like I did, exactly. <laughs> so that was really interesting that, and then I, for a probably good decade, more than a decade, I would go back to that movie over and over when I couldn't sleep or if I was severely depressed, I kept going back to that movie. Um, and then uh, years later, I realized it wasn't just that movie. It was many movies that I had been watching since I was a kid and a few uh, that I started watching as an adult. So, and then I decided um, back in 2017 that I wanted to write this book because I wanted to talk about my journey and help other, people's, other people sort of get to that same journey and use these movies that I put in the book as uh, as a way to cope for them to cope with uh, their own mental health struggles. That's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. Well, when you said that, I I didn't realize it, but I do the same thing. I mean, I have a tr I have a stack of movies. If I'm not feeling well mentally, mm -hmm. if I'm sick, anything, there's a different stack of movies I watch to bring me out of whatever state I'm in. Right, exactly. So a lot of people do that, even if you don't have any kind of mental health disorder. I mean, anybody who, who loves movies, you know, does that kind of thing. They just don't realize how good it is for them to do it. They don't realize they're doing something. You know, a lot of people think coping skills are something like yoga or exercising, you know, things they think they should do. 
but not everybody realizes things like movies or, or hiking the same trail over and over, TV, video games, watching cat videos, sing a song. Yeah. There's a lot of things you can do for yourself that maybe that, well, there's a lot of things you can do for yourself that you love. I'm not saying you shouldn't exercise. I'm not saying you shouldn't do yoga, but you might not get something out of that like somebody else does. And that's okay. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. I can't wait to grab your book. Well, because <laughs> I, you know, I have a brain injury, right? You know I think that? I did hear about yeah. that. Yeah. So I have a, I have a traumatic brain injury. I'm missing four areas of my brain. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I did when I, I, I get very high anxiety and I would watch Princess Bride, um, Saving Mr. Banks, uh, Mary yeah. Poppins, and I would go into those movies and it would calm me down. Granted, mm -hmm. I have to shut everything else off, but you have just enlightened me that I have been doing this and I didn't even know I was doing it. <laughs> well, you know, there's, there's actually science behind this too. And um, the term of sort of using movies as therapy is called cinema therapy. Hmm. So there have been various studies done that have shown how helpful it is, especially if you're... Um, you know, you, you journal about the movie and sort of your feelings, you talk about it with anyone or, or there are actually cinema therapists in the Denver area. I haven't talked to any of them, but I did do a search online for, for cinema therapists and they are available, which is pretty cool. It really is. <laughs> and I didn't look around the U.S., but I'm sure there's, there's, uh, there's plenty of cinema therapists all over, but Two of the big ones, Gary Solomon and Bridget Waltz, you know, they talk about um, they talk about how movies help them, and also how the, their patients, they and clients they worked with, how much doing that with them helps help their their clients. Well, then, what are your goals for this book? I mean, I, I mean, is you told us a bit about your journey, what brought you to my, to write this book mm -hmm. and the discovery you had with movies, but what are your goals for this book? What, what would you like to see happen when people read this book and afterwards? I think I would like to see what some of the people who've already talked to me about it. I'd like to see, you know, people sort of feeling like, wow, watching this particular movie, like for instance, Inside Out, which is currently my favorite movie and my favorite go-to. Um, which is about the five basic emotions in an 11-year-old girl's mind. Um, so I hope people, when they watch, <laughs> when they watch a movie like Inside Out, uh, or especially Inside Out, they get this feeling that it's okay to be sad. Mm -hmm. It's okay to, to be scared. It's okay to be angry. Um, you know it's okay to feel these things. This is the human experience. Even if you feel these things to the point where you've gotten some kind of diagnosis with mental health symptom, this is, this is perfectly fine. You're not, there's nothing bad about you because you're doing this. There's nothing wrong with you, you know, and movies, watching movies are a, a pretty cheap way to find a way to sort of do some kind of therapy. You know, people talk about things like art therapy. That's more expensive, really, than movies, I would say. Well, and going, <laughs> yeah, and let alone going to a therapist. For a lot of people, they can't afford that. Or there's the stigma. That's another thing I want to talk about is stigma. Because that's one of my lifelong goals is to decrease stigma around mental health. And I'm hoping the book will do some of that as well. Just sharing my story. That's another thing people have said to me that that was really powerful or they didn't know that I was going through that. And I just want to, you know, destigmatize as much as I possibly can. Oh, that's tremendous. I mean, as a military brat, I grew up military and then a military spouse, mental health is a hush hush. You never talk about it because it will, it will end a military career. And right. so even, even the family members are afraid to ever ask for help. And so I, that's probably where I got the whole, just go into my own world, sit and watch a movie and just go away into it. Yeah. Forget all the other pain because I couldn't go. I, in my, my thought processes, I can't go or it'll affect our 
paycheck. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so that's the whole, another, another avenue for you is to get into the military, somehow into the military world, because that stigma is deeply ingrained in us not to right. get help. Which is incredibly sad because of the, you know, the high suicide rates and in, in the, you know, people who served in the military. It's just, it's just so sad. And I know that, but luckily there's a lot of things out there online about helping folks with PTSD or other kinds of issues. Um, so, sorry, I'm about to cough here. That's okay, I sneezed on you. <laughs> <clears throat> so, you know, but yeah, it's good. You know, there are things I talk about in the book about a time when I felt numb. And other, the cinema therapists, especially Bridget Waltz talked about that. When they were feeling numb, they wanted to feel something. You know, they wanted to cry. They wanted to do something. So watching, say, a sad movie. You know, there's a scene in The Hunger Games, which is a pretty violent movie, so that can sort of have a negative effect. But there's a scene in there that makes me cry every time. So, you know, if I'm feeling like that, I want to cry, I want to let something out, but I can't. That'll do it every time. I, I, my go-to cry movie is What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams. Yes, <laughs> that's definitely a cry movie. <laughs> because if I need to make sure I just get it all out, I will watch that movie and just lose it. But it's a feel-good cry afterwards because, you know, no spoiler alert, it's a, it's a wonderful movie. But you yeah. will cry. Exactly. And that, that's, you you're just enlightening me here because I there are movies I watch on purpose so that I can have certain emotions fully come out. Yeah. Wow. Well, that movie also deals with mental health. Yes. Themes very wife. much. Yeah. His wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would definitely, I definitely think that's a good movie, not just for crying, but to sort of try to understand, you know, how some people, you know, they can't even deal with, with, the sadness is so acute, they feel they can't do anything, you know? That is true, because um, what is it? Spoiler alert again. If you don't, haven't watched the movie, his heaven is her paintings. Her hell is mm -hmm. her depression. And you get to visually see her depression. And it, it, it's, it's painful. And it, it, oh, I'm going to cry. Wait, I'm going to get it out of my head. <laughs> It's a beautiful movie. And well, yeah, and it also, you know, I'm a huge fan of Robin Williams. Um, and I really feel like with that movie, it's one of his best acting jobs. Because it's not a comedic movie, no. not in the least. But uh, no, he, I'm a huge fan of his and, and the, you know, struggles he dealt with to say, his in his movie. life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was, that was very unfortunate. Um, but the good thing is, is that, you know, a lot of people saw him as someone that they admired and decided they were going to get mental health help. Exactly. You know? he, he put a light on, you know, people with deep depression or can hide it and hide it well. Or in his case, he gave out so much so much mm -hmm. that when he was alone he pulled back even deeper than he could pull himself out half the time exactly that last time but no it's no i'm glad we got onto robin williams because yes he's a perfect example of how movies I, I think a lot of his he was able to keep himself out of the darkness because he would put himself into a character exactly yeah and, and that was one of the things he said he threw himself so much into a character he forgot who he was Mm -hmm. and that's the opposite <laughs> he kind of went too far but wow and there's some amazing documentaries about him i'm not thinking of what the titles are off the top of my head but if you go to imdb or just google robin williams documentary that's probably better to google it because yeah, i don't know the titles but you know there's a lot of great documentaries about him and how close he was to billy crystal Mm -hmm. They were you know. very, very close, yeah. So, and Billy Crystal is in When Harry Met Sally and in The Princess Bride, and those are two of the movies in the book. Oh, awesome. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm excited for this book. 
The book is called, that I keep calling the book, the book is called Our Favorite Movies, How Films Affect Our Mental Health, and it's written by Anne Feustel. And you'll see her name back there. It's F-E-U-S-T-E-L. And look her up on Amazon. The book is available there. And leave a review. New books always please. need reviews. So please grab the book, read through it, leave a review, and you know, let's help this book get out because people need to realize that emotion is part of being human and you don't have to always be happy and you know or and if you are sad it's okay to be sad it's okay to be angry these are human emotions and when we hold them back that's when we have problems when we try to stifle them that's when we have problems and uh, i know a lot of people watch me and they think michelle is so happy all the time not true but <laughs> I actually have the same thing going on with me because, you know, I have a lot of optimism and I can be a happy person, but a lot of people think the same with me. So yeah, I hear like, you on that. I have my downtimes. I, I go away and as extroverted as I seem, I'm quite the introvert. I'm just very, very good at faking being an extrovert for long periods of time. And then I shut down and I go away. It's yeah. my way of reviving the inside. So then I smile again. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. In your book, you talk about the ick factor, I-C-K. What does that, does it stand for something? What, what is that? Okay. So the ick factor is something I came up with. And it's basically, I look at these movies and I determine how much these movies help me with my mental health symptoms, with my mania my depression and my anxiety. And then on the other side, does the movie have transphobia? Does the movie have fat phobia, xenophobia, racism, sexism, et cetera? Now for me as, as a, I'll, I'll call myself, you know, an overweight woman and I don't think there's really anything wrong with that. Um, fat phobia really gets me, you know? Yeah. So that was really important. So I sort of try to figure out you know, uh, where is it in the equation? So, you know, the perfect example is inside out because there's nothing, there's an, oh, and I also talk about excessive violence. So there's no violence, no anything like that, racism, et cetera. Um, and then a movie like Tommy Boy with Chris Farley and David Spade, there's a lot of fat jokes in there, yeah. but the jokes tend to be um, insults from people who are mean or, you know, they feel insecure. Yeah, it's not nice. just, you know, there's, there's a little bit of nuance to them, or at least that's the way I perceive it. Um, and then a movie with fat phobia that I left out was Shallow Hal because it wasn't just these people who were making these jokes were mean. It was a lot of different characters. And they would do jokes like, so the woman in it is about the size that I am, but it's Gwyneth Paltrow yeah. in a fat suit because the main character has this magic on him. Makes me makes him see, you know, the heart of people and that translates into physical attractiveness, right? So a lot of jokes throughout the movie and the idea that really physical attractiveness is somebody who's skinny. If she's my size, but in her, you see that heart in her, you're going to see Gwyneth Paltrow. And you see scenes like, breaking a chair, you know, sitting in a chair with metal legs and breaking it, sitting in a very sturdy booth uh, and breaking it. It's, these are the kind of things when I used to love this movie, but when I really thought about it, it made me incredibly sad. Yeah. I couldn't watch incredibly it. Incredibly sad. I couldn't watch it. Yeah. Cause it was just so excessive on the fat jokes and I'm yeah. like, really? And so I, I, I remember turning it off. <laughs> Now, another movie, unfortunately, you know, we already established I love Robin Williams, but in Mrs. Doubtfire, there's a lot of transphobia in that movie, you oh, know. He cross dresses uh, to be the lady. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, yeah, he cross dresses, he, he gets a divorce or separation from his wife for a separation, then it'll be a divorce. And he had a lot of time with his kids. He was basically the primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. And then he loses custody or he doesn't get, he loses the custody battle. So he dresses up as a woman, as this, you know, very different looking person to be a nanny to them. 
but all these jokes about you know and songs like dude looks like a lady it's very hurtful and i was reading online a lot of trans folks were very hurt by that performance and there's a particular situation where he pretends um the, the his ex-wife is looking for nannies and he um pretends to be a, a you know like a real trans person and sort of goes like actually i used to be a man oh yeah and how and then she freaks out and you know hangs up the phone and then when the kids see that you know um see that he is a man but they don't know it's his dad they want to hurt him possibly you know beat him up you know there's a bunch of scenes in there that are kind of kind of sad when it comes to you know trans folks are someone that should be avoided that should be hurt beaten you know so but you know it's so hard for me to talk about that on the other hand because i love robin williams there's so many movies i adore and i think that's more on the writers really but to say he's the actor <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you know back in the 90s it wasn't really you know we didn't really talk about trans folks and uh, that much or at least not sort of the positives and things no but he was I mean, the sweetest man actually was the joke think. because they had a, a tv show called bosom buddies and then that yeah. movie with somebody called it was called tootsie really? yeah tootsie so bosom buddies with tom hanks and tootsie with dustin hoffman dustin hoffman yeah and also with the dustin hoffman character you know there's the uh woman he's in love with his, her dad falls for him as dorothy but then it turns out that like he's he's something the dad makes some kind of like thing where like you know as a man since i was in love with you i want to hurt you you know it threatens him in some way because he finds out he's a man and it just oh, so it, it messes up his his manlyhood when he finds himself attracted to another man yeah I, I remember when um boy george came out and uh everyone a lot of people thought he was a woman do you remember yeah, that? you were you were young for that you were yeah really <laughs> i was born in the 80s yeah, so yeah, you sure. weren't even born but come a come a come a come a come a chameleon he was yeah. singing and dancing and people just love him and they said why why would this pretty girl call himself boy george i'm like that's a man no 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 that's a beautiful woman okay it's a beautiful woman but that's a man <laughs> and and i remember just losing i was living in nebraska and people would lost it when they found out that boy george who is not faking it he's calling himself boy george still thought he was a woman yeah yeah that that he was the wow i remember a lot of controversy about that but his music is so good no one cared exactly well that was the thing that was sort of also sort of the makeup and the eyeliner and all that kind of thing a lot of you know so their straight folks were doing that too but to say most of our musicians back then were all wearing makeup with big hair and wearing heels so we really <laughs> Everyone was androgynous back then. Exactly, so. which was very exciting. I sort of, sometimes I wish that I could have more experience. And I saw some of that when I was growing up in the 80s. Yeah, I kind of, maybe we done. should have everything referred back because, you yeah. know, maybe the LGBTAQ world should have come out then because everyone would have, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're lucky, like, I'm, uh, you know, we're lucky to live in this time for a variety of reasons but when oh, it yes. comes to lgbtq plus community yes it's, it's so much better you know a movie like mrs doubtfire would be sort of taken very differently today yeah but it made people aware i mean so that's the other thing is we put things out in a time where it wasn't accepted in normal public yeah but it made people realize that there are people who really are trans out there i mean there are was that um I just forgot his name. I, uh, you got to work. A uh, RuPaul. RuPaul. Yeah, I'm obsessed I mean, with RuPaul. And RuPaul came out, and you're like, who is he? But th those pioneers, he's a pioneer that came out and took the world by storm. And everyone's like, you know what? We don't care. He's amazing, you know. And and that's yeah. good, so that he opened doors for people now exactly we've got to look back at 
they were brave enough to come out in a world that would have killed them normally. And think of all the, the gates and doors he had to knock through to get to where he is. That he was an icon of what everyone was afraid of, basically, you know? Right, exactly. No, that was RuPaul, and not only, it, it's mostly drag queens with people who identify as men on the show, but there are more and more, there's trans folks, trans yes. folks on the show, which is pretty exciting. Yes. You know, but he's just amazing. He, I don't know if you have Netflix, but he has a new show, AJ and the Queen, mm -hmm. about him and this young kid who is sort of basically non-binary, where the kid, they, you know, they're not really sure, are they a girl or a boy? They dress like a boy. So they're just exploring. You know, so it's it's really, it's a really cool show, AJ and the Queen. Well, I was, hmm, was going to say, uh, I don't even know if this ties in. My, one of the very first stories I told on National Public Radio was called, um, It's the Rice Pilaf. And it's a fun story. It's on my, it's on my YouTube page, very, probably on the way bottom, but it's called the Rice Pilaf. And in it, I talk about my friends, Scott and Kelly. And through the whole story, I never talk about it's Scott and Kelly, Scott and Kelly. Scott and Kelly are two men. And cool. I don't say it until like later on in the story because Kelly is a very, he was a very well-known drag queen in Kansas City. And Kelly and Scott are Uncle Kelly and Uncle Scott. And I told this story and no one caught it to the very end. And I went, because Kelly can be a boy's name too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's just. Oh, my God, that's I, awesome. I love that the world has been able to be real and just accept people as they are. And it's, it's happening more and more and far more than we actually, I, I, than I thought it ever would from growing up, seeing people get beat up in school all the time and things like that. That doesn't happen that often anymore. Now, just sorry to interrupt, but I just want to make sure I got to talk about fried green tomatoes. Oh yeah. You've seen that? Yeah. But yeah. So Goodness. part of the, it's set in about the 1930s and then the eighties. Um, and in the 30s, there's this two adult female friends who, you know, uh, a lot of people have said they're romantically linked. We don't see them. It's very, um, it, it's not, it's ambiguous in the movie, but it seems to most people, it's been called a lesbian classic, you know. And of course, these two women couldn't necessarily be public about how they feel for each other but you could tell with jealousy and anger and all these different things in this movie you know and a lot of people a lot of people believe that it's romantic i think it is at least it's it's one-sided but uh sally i think i lost field. you there no i got it sally field uh no that's uh mary stewart masterson and oh I should know this. I should know who are who's in this Caucus? movie. But yeah, look that up. Look that up. Um, um, maybe we can put that on the. Um, maybe we can put that for uh, a note for the podcast, something like that. Um, if you're putting things online, maybe write that up. Mary Stuart yeah. Masterson, and I can't believe I can't remember that. There's also Jessica Lang and Kathy Bates. Yeah, there's a whole bunch yeah. of really famous women in it. Exactly. It's a, it's a masterful movie. You know, and then what's interesting is, is one of the main characters, Iggy. Is she trans? Is she non-binary? You know, she doesn't like to be reminded that she was, you know, she's considered to be a woman by everybody around her. She never wears the only, we only see her once in women's clothes when she, or girls clothes when she's a kid. And she immediately, well, she within a, a little, maybe an hour or less, she can't, she can't stand to be in the dress. She has to go put on boys clothes. So. Well, we are getting really close to our end time. And I wanted to remind everyone who we're watching and talking to right now. We are talking to Anne Feustel 
and that's Anne, A-N-N-E, like my middle name, Feustel, F-E-U-S-T-E-L. She's the founder and owner of Writing Wisely. You can learn more about her at www, and what they do, www.wearewritingwisely.com. She just wrote a book called Our Favorite Movies, How Films Affect Our Mental Health, and Wow, I've learned so much from Anne today, <laughs> and uh, I, I look forward to you know writing down some of the movies that are in your book and grabbing mm -hmm. your book and learning more about it. But to hear about your journey through your the manic and the depression and all that, and how movies have helped you go into another place to bring yourself back. Can I put in a quick plug if we're wrapping up here? Please, that's exactly um, what I want you to do. <laughs> so both of us know and love a woman named Amy Colette. Yes. And she was my book coach throughout the process of the book. And she was my editor. And I published the book through her imprint, Powerfully Positive Publications, um, or Positively, Positively Powered Communications. Yeah, that's And then, um, so Unleash Her Inner Author is her uh, book coaching company. So I wouldn't have been able to do this book without her. It wouldn't have looked like it did without her. So I just wanted to um, put in positively powered uh, publications and unleash your inner author for her. And I'll uh, make sure I put that um, her website yes. on on this link when we when we put it all up so that people can find her too. Because there are so many people out there who want to share their story or have a book in mind and don't know what to do next. And Amy is awesome. Yes. She just yes. <laughs> it just is. So, Anne, is there anything that you would like people to know about your book, about what the future on the book is, um, how they can find out what's happening next? I mean, anything. Well, um, you can follow me on Facebook. I have a page that's called Writing Wisely, the same name as my company. Um, so that's my business page. Okay. Um, I'm on LinkedIn under my full name, Ann Foistall. So just search for Ann Foistall on LinkedIn. And then you can check out my website, as we talked about, wearewritingwisely.com. And purchase the book on Amazon yes. so we can talk more about it. Exactly. Our movies, how films affect our mental health. And as Ann said, if you are going through some things, and you're afraid to go see um, a therapist or a counselor, talk to anybody. Use a movie to at least get yourself into a state that you can function again. Mm -hmm. But Anne is here to break the stereotypes of finding help, basically. Exactly. You know, and I want just to tell everybody, you know, I'm, I'm here um, in this life to, to help everybody. And just to make it a little easier for you, if you do want to buy my book and you want it signed, um, you can contact me off of my website um, and in the subject line just put um, mental shift and we'll get you 25 percent off so um, yeah I'll get you get you that book if, if eighteen dollars um, on Amazon or, or eight dollars for the Kindle that kind of thing Awesome. Well, thank you so much for doing that for our listeners. And I'll put that also in the, in the, um, in the writing so they know to put the subject line mental shift and they'll get 25% off your book with it signed, which is awesome. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for <laughs> listening. I really enjoyed it. I did too. Thank you so much, Anne. And everyone, thank you for for listening in and share this podcast. We've got the video. We also have the audio. Feel free to share it, especially to someone that you know may need it. You never know. Everything happens for a reason. You're hearing this for a reason. Be sure to share it. And until next time, this is Michelle Moraw signing off on Mental Shift. And thank you, Anne Foy, still for joining me. You're welcome. Bye. Bye.